Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Andy Cruza with Nacho Nacho uh, for another Nacho Tuesday. And here today I'm with Dave Bunce with Hawk AI. And today we're going to discuss uh, AI and the future of marketing, which seems to be a pretty hot topic lately with uh, Chad GPT apparently taking people's jobs. <laughs> but uh, Dave's got a lot of a uh, lot of experience in the space, uh, both as a marketer and also an AI. So we'd love to hear from him today, uh, starting with an elevator pitch for what Hawk AI does, and we'll go from there. Yeah, thanks for having me, Andy. Excited to, to chat today. And so Hawk AI is a marketing technology platform that really does three core things. It monitors and reports on your digital marketing results, which in and of itself, okay, cool, that's great. Uh, but on top of that, we layer in benchmarking of that performance and contextualize it against uh, industry trends and your industry uh, performance. So, you know, your results are... 10% increase in a cost per acquisition over the last year, your competitors have gone up 20% on that same platform, or they've gone down 10% and you're lagging the industry. So giving those benchmarks and those guidelines to performance. And then afterwards, we do the analysis to quickly identify where specifically in your uh, marketing stack or tactics you can improve. So looking at uh, you know faster visibility into issues, and that's really where the value is. With all that information, you're able to optimize faster. You're able to course correct faster and get better results. That's great. Yeah, that you bring up a good point. So a lot of people think AI is a replacement tool, but you know, to your point, it's uh, really a complementary tool to enhance the the work that you're already doing. Um, That's right. Great. With that yeah, said, we, oh, go ahead, yeah, sorry. I was going to say we've we've seen even you know in the job reports and that from LinkedIn and, and some of the highest growing or vacancy rates. Mm -hmm. Digital marketers, you know, there's 200,000 open postings for marketing jobs. So, you know, as much as we're worried about AI taking those jobs, it's, it's really about filling those positions that, that need filling as opposed to, you know, taking what's, what's already existing. Great. So what, what do you think are the applications for AI in 2023 and beyond? And what would you say to people that are skeptical about it? Because there's certainly a lot of skeptic, skeptics out there, and including me and some, some of the pitches I've heard for AI, uh, you know, the pie in the sky kind of ideas, you know, you're like, oh, I don't think it's ready for that yet. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And I think that that is what I would say is it's going to be an 80 20 rule mm -hmm. approach. I think, you know, full confidence and implementation of AI solutions without human oversight, judgment, decision making, uh, you know, is, is leading to challenges potentially. Um, and so what I think, you know, I would say is find solutions or AI enabled software that let you still have visibility into what is happening and what changes are being made. So as opposed to black box automation, I'd say find something that you can sort of easily understand, digest, audit, or, you know, have the, the checkbox, if you will. Even with our software, you know, what we do is we present the findings and the optimizations, but they still require that human checkmark approval process, and then we push as opposed to, you know, behind the scenes, the, the machine just doing stuff, as people yeah. would say. Yeah, yeah it's, not, uh, it's not just pressing the easy button. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> you've got to have humans in the loop, right? Mm -hmm. um, I guess, what other applications do you see for AI marketing outside of, you know, what a Hawk AI does? Yeah, I mean, chat GPT, obviously, as you mentioned, is, is a hot topic, right? <laughs> just yeah. kidding. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's all the rage and everybody on LinkedIn is, you know, posting, here's my 10 tips to use it. Um, what, what application I think is interesting there, again, in terms of N8020 is helping produce content uh, and producing outreach in the marketing field. So understanding everything from sales and, and outbound content uh, into, you know, ad copy itself, et cetera. I think, you know, the machine and, and open uh, open AI doesn't necessarily have the context of brand, right? You can type that in, but will it really resonate? I think the application though of, of getting ideas, thought starters, that brainstorm list is where I see it going. And, and that's sort of the, you know, the thesis of, of everything is to me, build it, use it as an efficiency tool. Mm -hmm. Don't use it as a replacement. And, and that's sort of my, my thinking on it from an application standpoint. 
That's a great point. Yeah, I've noticed the limitations myself. You know, I was asking it questions about stock tips. <laughs> uh, yeah. Any, any uh, reliable results, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing too is if you look at AI, like outside of ChatGPT, you know, there's some of the the visualization AI around things like Dolly and those sorts of things, um, where you say like, give me an image for this, or give me something in this image. That is not ready for creative consumption in, in my yeah. mind yet. Um, it's cool to play with and see, and you can, you know, uh, again, play, play around with it, but it, it isn't, uh, in my mind yet, ready for, for commercialization. So take those with a grain of salt. But, you know, applications around, again, brainstorm, ideation, um, intros to content, et cetera, that, that's really helpful. And I think the delineation factor also would be, um, internal versus external applications. So if you're a, a digital marketer using it for the purposes of internal, either briefs or brainstorms or those sorts of things, cool. Get confident with that before you use it for external purposes, like writing ad copy. Yeah. And you don't recommend using it for uh, job interviews? <laughs> Just <kidding. laughs> no. Yeah, there's so many, so many stories and memes around <laughs> these days. It's hard to keep up with. Yeah. Awesome. So what would you say about uh, companies that are thinking about cutting back on marketing spend during uncertain times? And um, I guess, what would you say to those companies and how could AI uh, ultimately help improve their efficiency as a company uh, so that yeah. they don't feel like they have to cut back on marketing? Great question. And, and we, we did a study on this uh, from our Q4 results. So as I said, we benchmark our data. So we have over 6,000 businesses with their data connected in Hawk AI. And what we're able to do then is see trends uh, and, an and analyze year over year, month over month performance uh, across the different platforms when we aggregate those 6,000 uh, businesses. So when we do that, we saw some interesting things uh, related to Q4. And what we actually saw, particularly Black Friday, Cyber Monday, was the businesses connected improved uh, their year over year revenue by 19%. Oh, and wow. so you know, those that stayed invested reaped the rewards. There was a better return on ad spend in this last quarter than there was in 2021. Now, 2021 was a bit of an anomaly. You know, everybody was still kind of uh, tucked away a little bit and there was a lot of money floating around and a lot of, um, you know, still, uh, still a lot of confidence from the consumer. So, you know, we, we saw in Q4, amazingly, we saw you know, increases in, in revenue. So even though the broad overarching concerns exist from a macroeconomic perspective, and I'm putting on my, my CPA hat, I've spent seven years in an accounting firm. Um, you know, when, I, when I think about the macroeconomic factors of you know, inflation, interest rates, you know, political, geopolitical conditions, all those things, yeah, it makes sense that people are, are thinking, oh, we're in a recession or we're heading for one or whatever. Mm -hmm. But none of the data that we have in terms of what we're actually seeing from the top line of businesses that are investing in digital marketing, none of it indicates it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's really a, this dichotomy of, you know, you've, I've, we've seen from a distribution standpoint, people have pulled back. We saw a reduction in spend, especially in Q4 on Meta, Etc. on different platforms. Um, but those that stayed in got the best return on ad spend they've seen in a long time. Yeah. So as, as much as, you know, pulling back is the, is the first thing to do, I, I would say, you know, monitor it against those standard metrics of return against that ad spend, understand mm -hmm. what you're, and measure what you're getting for those dollars. Because yes, you can peel back marketing, but what is the implication in two, three months when you're, um, a top of funnel uh, uh, dries up. So that's a great point. I'd love to brought some uh, data into that as well. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people might have a subjective opinion about it, but you know, you're you know, you're actually using real data that you guys are seeing to actually verify that you know companies should be moving forward with their marketing spend because as other companies might be pulling back, it creates a great opportunity for companies to get out in front of prospective customers. And, you know, as they say, biz business must move on. <laughs> so. That's right. And, and I know you asked, you know, what would, how can AI help in, in that process? And I think it, it's not necessarily about, um, you know, cutting back total budget necessarily, but it's about finding the right allocation and media mix. Yeah. So being able to quickly pivot or change, okay, my campaigns on this platform aren't producing right now. I need to go and change it and reallocate spend to this platform or, this campaign for this audience or this product 
is really working. Let's double down on that and let's move away from something else. And great. that's what, what the AI can do. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, what other tips would you recommend for small business owners that might want to continue growing their business during uncertain ec economic times, not including just with marketing spend? Mm. Uh, I would say a couple of things. One is in general, you're going to have, I would say you're going to have the investment in growth. You said they want to grow, right? Yeah. So whether that be marketing or, you know, sales, and those are two different functions. I know we talked about them kind of interchangeably, but investing in sales, investing in marketing, you're going to need to deploy. If you want to grow, you're going to have to deploy capital to do it. And yeah. so, you know, understanding where it goes is the key and understanding the efforts and the return and the efficacy of the different teams and functions you could deploy that to. Um, from a financial standpoint, putting on my, my finance hat again, you know, I also look at if you're looking to grow, what investments can you make that increase your output or your capacity, depending on what type of business you are, right? So if you think of it as, you know, I, I, I want to grow, you can either do, you know, you can either raise your price, which in this environment you know is justifiable but some customers might might bail on that uh, but you can either raise your price or you can sell more stuff or you can cut cost right and so you know operational efficiencies and this is again just sort of talking as you said advice outside of outside of marketing if you save a dollar if you make a dollar in sales and say hey i generate an extra dollar of revenue mm -hmm. you have margin on that you have cost against that right if you save a dollar of expense, that's a dollar of earnings, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, look at that from the perspective of optimize your expenses, make sure that you are as lean as possible. If there are investments you can make and get funding for that uh, make you more operationally efficient, better equipment, machinery, whatever it may be, um, or technology tools, you spend on those. And then that can create the efficiency that goes directly to the bottom line as opposed to having to service the top line revenue that you generate. Speaking as a spend management platform ourselves, I, I definitely agree with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's a great example, right? Like find ways, and even if it's going to your your vendors and you know, and you know, I, it's funny because I'm a, obviously a vendor, um, but you know, people come to us sometimes and say, like, it's on our renewal and your rates have gone up, but can we maintain legacy rates or, Hey, I need to decrease my accounts by a couple. How, what can we do here? Or how can we be, you know, more cost efficient, or maybe you don't need the premium plan. Maybe you didn't need the starter plan and, and finding those solutions are all tactical things you can do to like find bottom line efficiency in these times without cutting marketing costs. Yeah. And on average, a lot of companies uh, usually waste around 30% of their software spend. <laughs> uh, it, it, it becomes quite a bit of money once, especially once you start to scale. So it's, it's definitely not a, a small cookies, I guess, if you will. And, but, uh, okay. and for Nacho Nacho, like the, the, you know, the value proposition I see is, you know, being able to see and manage those subscriptions kind of in, in one place and be able to monitor those uh, is really important. Right? Yeah. Cause a lot of, tr you know, having visibility into everything, you know, speaking, of, speaking as somebody that's big on numbers and analytics and whatnot, Having that visibility is is key to be being able to make the right decisions. And you mentioned, you know, KPIs and marketing and just, you know, making sure that you're investing in the right channels for growth. I guess the counter to that would be, what would you say is an overrated KPI that a lot of companies have um, that, you know, maybe they're over-focusing on and they shouldn't be? Yeah. Uh, the first one would be that those impressions, like those vanity metrics, what you see a lot of is like, hey, this many people saw our ad. Yeah. Great. And if, and if you're going for brand awareness, you know, that that's good, but in general, you know, understanding that you need to see those results trickle down over time is, is one. Um, so, you know, understanding even social content, like, sure, we got this many likes or yeah. this many people shared our post, you know, you get cool. these examples of, of, of that and, and the actual connection is very hard to make in terms of, of, you know, the value of social content like that to business results. Yeah, definitely agree there. Um, what do you think is an overrated marketing tactic these days um, that, that a lot of companies are deploying that might not be as effective as it used to be? 
Yeah, uh, and I'll bring some again. The the data into this one is is a bit of a surprise. I I thought, but email marketing uh, is is down. Transaction rates that we saw year over year for the businesses connected uh, are are down by about a percent from a conversion rate standpoint, and and revenue generated from email is down uh, year over year. So I think I think to me it's it's not even the fact that email doesn't necessarily make sense. I think what's happened is the volume of emails that are being sent, and we can see some of this, is the velocity and the frequency of emailing without you know, sort of segmenting your audiences effectively is watering down that conversion rate because you're sending more and more out there, more people are clicking on them, but it may not be what they're looking for. So email can still be effective and it's you know, a, a valuable life cycle, sort of nurturing loyalty approach, but you know, to think of it as, uh, you know, just a way to blast content isn't, isn't going to be effective. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, uh, I've heard that from a lot of uh, other founders that I've interviewed as well. Um, you know, the lack of personalization is a, a kind of a big concept with email because there's a lot of great tools out there now to enrich data and, you know, get anybody's email address that we need. Um, Apollo.io being one of those mm -hmm. platforms, but it's become so easy for everybody to do it. So everybody's doing it. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the volume emails, uh, especially cold email marketing is growing drastically. So people have become accustomed to just, unless it's a great pitch and it looks very personalized for that person and what their their needs are, you really address their problem and understand their company and you demonstrate that in, your, in your, uh, the body of your email as well as the subject line, you're not going to get a response from people. They just, they just tune it out and ignore it just like all the other ones. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I, I've seen some good thought leadership um, from gong.io, like the G-O-N-G. Yeah. Io, um, around best practices from email and, and things that they've seen as well from their sort of CRM uh, analytics perspective. And, and you're right, it is, you know, subject line analysis and all that. So if people are ever interested, there are studies out there that, that have that uh, information on, on that. Yep, it's always evolving. Uh, what do you think is another, uh, an underrated marketing goal or KPI that a lot of companies might miss that they could take advantage of today? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll answer it twofold. One is we are seeing because of uncertainty in the economy and because of inflation, we are seeing a lot of shopping right now. And what I mean by that is a lot of people looking for alternatives. So in general, transaction rates on websites are down. Um, you know, the number, in other words, you know, for every hundred people that come to a, an e-commerce site, we've seen a decrease in how many of those lead to a sale. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the patterns would suggest that, you know, people are, are hunting around or, you know, sort of those pages, number of times people come back before they convert type of information. We're seeing yeah. an increase in that. Yeah. So I think when you say like what, what tactics kind of play well in that and, and what we've seen from a conversion rate and session standpoint is, um, is some of that sort of social proof type tactics, whether that be, you know, the influencer approach or whether that be, you know, affiliate marketing where you have referral partners. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen a lot of uh, uptake in, in those channels because what happens when somebody is looking for alternatives, they usually, you know, ask their friends or look on social media or, you know, they go to a trusted source. Mm -hmm. um, and even, you know, referral or affiliate can relate to, you know, product review sites like a G2 or uh, Captera or any of those. Those channels are proving to be valuable because people are looking for alternatives right now. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Yeah, and in the, in the world of marketing where, you know, ads are everywhere and, you know, even there's advertorials where <laughs> there's sponsored posts that look like an article, but it's really the brand mm -hmm. writing it. Um, you know, transparency and I guess, you know, being able to trust trust the source, whether it's a good product to use or service to use for that matter, always comes back to, you know, your peers and people like you that could validate if that is in, in fact a good product that you should also invest your money into as well. A hundred percent. And when we talk about influencers, you know, I think there's that common misperception of, you know, it's, it's the Instagram account with, uh, you know, 10 million followers and, you know, a celebrity Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, where we actually see a lot of efficacy from an influencer standpoint is very niche, uh, more micro focused community based influencers, you know, um, 
you know, the, the person that's seen as a subject matter expert in home renovation or, you know, this person, this micro influencer that does personal financial planning yeah. uh, is a way better influencer in, in terms of bang for the buck than getting yeah. like Snoop Dogg to, you know, promote your mortgage product. Definitely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for software companies, like a lot of software reviewers, maybe on YouTube could be, you know, good people to go after, you know, they might have a hundred thousand, 200,000 followers. Um, you know, a lot of them might do it for free. Just they need content. Right. Um, yeah. but yeah, once you get to those upper tiers and they can get really, really expensive. <laughs> no knock on Snoop. I like, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I, love, I love what you talked about Nacho Nacho. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I guess the key to analyzing those people too, is the amount of, you know, is it your niche audience that you're trying to go after and look at the engagement, right? Do they get a lot of comments on their posts? Do they get a lot of views relative to the amount of followers that they have? That could really help you know, tell you if that's a great micro influencer to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, with that said, what other marketing and adver advertising channels perform uh, really well during a recession, in your opinion? Yeah, I think, and this is, uh, this is one's a little bit out there, but what actually, again, going back to the idea of people looking for alternatives and shopping mm -hmm. around from a pricing standpoint or, uh, you know, analyzing their, their expenses is, competitor campaigns, depending on, you know, where you sell and what you sell in general, competitor campaigns. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, bidding on keywords, uh, such as the brand name of your competitors or, or specific words that they, uh, they advertise against or bid on. But, um, typically those are very expensive and you don't have a good quality score. And, you know, it, it's generally, you know, seen as a, as an ancillary tactic. And I, I would still say it's an ancillary tactic, even in uncertain times, but um, experimenting with that right now would be an interesting time to do it in the sense of, you know, in a recession, people are looking for alternatives. There's price sensitivity, there's competition. Um, this, this could be the time to, to try those campaigns at least to see the efficacy of them, uh, in, in my opinion. But, you know, again, that's just a, a my general thought. Don't, uh, don't get upset for that. Actually, because, uh, you know, a lot of these, we talked about some brands scaling back on marketing. Some of your competitors might be scaling back. And this could be a good tactic to get in front of their prospective customers um, and take advantage of the economic downturn and, you know, get a better return on ad spend for yourself. A hundred percent. And if nothing else, if, if you can't engage in that kind of competition and price battle, um, I would at least make sure if nothing else, your brand terms are, are safe and well guarded from a bid strategy perspective um, and from an optimization standpoint so that, you know, if nothing else, when somebody types in your name, you're still showing up um, and showing up near the top. Great. Um, any, other, any other ideas for small businesses uh, when it comes to, you know, cutting costs? Uh, you mentioned mostly around operational. Uh, we talked about software as a service. A lot of people overspend there. Um, any any last tips that you might have around that? Yeah, one other tip, just more specific to marketing, but but not you know the software side is is average order value and and optimizing to that. So if you're already paying to get the customer, if you're already spending you know the customer acquisition cost for the click and all of that, the best thing you can do is make sure that when they do buy something, you're incentivizing a good average order value. Uh, or, you know, if, if you're selling a, a lead gen or a service as opposed to an e-commerce product, making sure that you've segmented your sort of leads, lead flow to be pointing towards high retail price or high service offering products. Um, and, and, you know, easy ways to think about average order value is things like think, uh, thinking about what price point you set your deals at. So, you know, get this 25% off if you spend a hundred bucks or, you know, those sorts of bundlings or, or, you know, have a loss leader and then tie it in with something else. It's, it, it's good marketing fundamentals, but just in general, specifically in uncertain times, recession, whatever we want to call it. If you're paying to get the person there anyways, let's make sure that they're spending the right amount of money or as much as possible. Um, and, and that's really, you know, one, one thing I'd say. Yeah, I've seen that Uber app does, Uber Eats does a pretty good job at that. They'll have constant promotions around. If you spend, you know, 25, 35, uh, you know, dollars, what have you, you'll save 25%. But 
now all that all, all the math is calculated out there right because those companies are those restaurants are trying to get to a certain order value like you said and you know they're willing to give a discount if they're going to get that you know a higher amount of cash in the door from uh, that sale bang on great so uh yeah we'd love to learn about the founding of your company how how the idea come about yeah so it, it's kind of the marriage of of two uh marketing agency uh operators that knew there was a need for this software so uh, I'm based in Toronto myself, um, and and we were running an agency here in Canada. Uh, Hawk Media uh, is an agency based out of California, and you know all over the United States, and now in Canada as well. Uh, and and we had parallel paths. So Hawk Media was aggregating data, looking for these trends, but they didn't have necessarily a machine yet to plug into to analyze all that information. They knew they wanted it in part of their vision. Meanwhile, in our agency in Canada, we were building that software um, to solve common problems like, you know, making sure budget stayed on track, making sure we knew if there was a problem with landing pages, making sure that our, you know, conversion uh, target for the month was on track for our clients. So we started building this thing. We realized that it was a product in and of itself. We sold our marketing agency in 2019, commercialized this product for a couple of years. Hawk Media came to us then, and we had known Hawk uh, for a long time, uh, said, you know, we have all the data and analytics, and we have this idea for benchmarking and trends. You have the software that tracks that information. Let's bring these two things together. So uh, our original product was acquired by Hawk in March of 2022, so just under a year ago. Um, and then in the last year, we brought that product into the Hawk Media ecosystem you know, rebranded it to Hawk AI and also added all the benchmarking and data sets that, that Hawk Media had aggregated over the years um, and applied their vision of how do we, you know, benchmark and how do we analyze trends and, and that. So, you know, the birthing of Hawk AI was really, you know, two agencies coming at uh, the same problem in different ways and coming together to solve it. Great. Yeah, sounds like a great success. Um... One thing I always like to bring up to in these interviews, uh, you know, is the point of failure, um, because I believe, you know, myself, you know, we, we've all had our experiences failing, right? And I feel like that's where you learn your biggest lessons from, you know, so I always like to bring that out from founders, because, you know, a lot of, a lot of times people see us, you know, at, at, at our peak, like, you know, successful and all that, but nobody understands like the road that it took to actually get there. Um, so, you know, love to hear a story of failure from you and, uh, you know, what you learned from it most importantly. Yeah. So I, because we built the software within our own agency first, before we rolled it out and commercialized it, we didn't start commercializing our product until 2020, late 2020. And so by that point, there, the, you know, it's a, it's a very competitive market. The MarTech space is, is highly, I would say, saturated more or less. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of competitors out there. Uh, you know, you don't, you don't have a lot of white space uh, in, in, the, in the competitive matrix. So our biggest roadblock to overcome was that constant question of how do you compare to dot, 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 because there was already some established players in the space. So we would get that a lot during our outreach slash uh, you know, demo calls of oh, how do you compare to this? And so we had to really, really, really refine our uh, value proposition and it took a long time and it we we weren't really sure of what that space was until candidly we came across sort of the, the partnership and, and acquisition opportunity with hawk where it became very clear that you know combining the monitoring and the performance metrics that we had with their data as well as the benchmarking concept okay now we're doing something different and interesting now we're providing something that the platforms don't you know, don't provide themselves. Um, and that was really the, the, the biggest failure, I guess, for lack of a better word, at the start of our business model um, uh, with, you know, not Hawk AI, but the company that, that became Hawk AI um, was, you know, carving out our space in the, in the competitive landscape and having something very unique to offer. Um, we, we took a long time to get there. Yeah, a lot of companies, it's, you know, it's really important, especially in the early stage, which, you know, which is why I love working with startups, because, you know, discovering that, uh, that USP, that unique selling proposition is the key to the entire business. 
right? And you have to be open for new ideas and how to approach it, listen to your customers, get good feedback. Um, but once you can nail that, then you have a you know a clear uh, path towards growth and actually acquiring more customers and making a business out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, great. Yeah, so we're almost out of time here, but you know, I'd love to learn which what kind of books you're reading this year. <laughs> good question. I, I, I just finished a couple um, that, I, that I'm reading. One of them is, uh, it, it's been out, I think, five or six years now, so it's not necessarily new, uh, mm-hmm. but it's called Homo Deus. Uh, it's written by uh, the guy who wrote Sapiens. Uh, so it's this sort of, you know, Sapiens idea is like basically a brief history of mankind. Uh, mm-hmm. And now, you know, Homo Deus is about what challenges is humanity facing in the next hundred thousand years sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, who are we today and how do we kind of tackle the problems of tomorrow uh, is really the, the big overarching question. And they talk about, you know, healthcare and, and, you know, immortality, environmental collapse, all these things. It's, it's not exactly the lightest of reading, um, yeah. but the concepts are very interesting to hear, like how we got to where we are. And then like, what are the things that we're going to be encountering in the next, you know, hundred years that we as a, you know, civilization have to have to overcome. Yeah, yeah. It's not all. It's, it's not all a rosy picture always. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, no. And then, yeah, yeah. And then the other book uh, I, I will do the sh- shameless plug. Hawk Media's CEO Eric uh, wrote a book called The Hawk Method, which is you know a great uh, intro to marketing, great. deep dive from somebody who has clearly grown thousands of brands through the agency. Um, and so Hawk Method, I'd. Re- to that too it's it's one of those new york time bestseller types um really digestible but it breaks down marketing you talk about what could small business owners do like i'd I'd pick up that book and you know i'm not promoting it and i don't have a coupon code sorry but um (laughs) i would i would check that out (laughs) yeah we get a book yeah Yeah, afterwards uh maybe if you find a coupon code feel free to post it on (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) Uh, just kidding no talking about increasing average order value uh value he doesn't want to Probably don't doesn't want to discount that. <laughs> but that thing's probably got gold and it's worth the price. So. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, Dave, you know, I really appreciate you coming on today and, and talking about AI and the future of marketing. Um, you know, as you mentioned, there's a lot of opportunities for startups and small business owners to take advantage of uncertain economic economic times when a lot of people are scaling back. It's your time to charge forward. And there's a lot of great new tools out there that can increase the operational efficiency of your company. So you can get a higher return on your ad spend and overall, you know, marketing mix. And, you know, we'd highly recommend that you guys check out Hawk uh, AI. It's in our marketplace right now for, I believe, is it 30% off lifetime? That's right. Yeah. Wow. That's a great deal. (laughs) Talking about 30% uh, average savings for SaaS, you know, here you go today, you get 30% off Hawk AI. So check it out in our SaaS marketplace today. Um, Nacho Nachos, the the number one one one-stop shop to manage, discover, and save on SaaS. Uh, Once again, Dave, thank you for the time today, and I appreciate you coming here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Andy.